Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Morell, and I work in the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. On behalf of the One Health Office, I'm pleased to welcome you to the monthly zoonoses and One Health updates call on October 7th, 2020. Next slide, please. Although the content of this webinar is directed to veterinarians, physicians, epidemiologists, and related public health professionals in federal, state, and local positions, the CDC has no control over who participates. Therefore, please exercise discretion on sensitive content and material as confidentiality cannot be guaranteed. Today's webinar is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect now. Next slide, please. Today's presentations will address one or more of the following five objectives. Describe two key points from each presentation. Describe how a multi-sectoral One Health approach can be applied to the presentation topics. Identify an implication for animal and human health. Identify a One Health approach strategy for prevention, detection, or response to public health threats. And identify two new resources from CDC partners. Next slide. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all presenters must disclose any financial or other associations with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters, as well as any use of unlabeled products or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses and partners wish to disclose they have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. The presentations will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. CDC did not accept commercial support for this activity. Next slide, please. Instructions for receiving free continuing education are available at cdc.gov slash one health slash Zohu slash continuing education. The course access code is one health 2020. To receive free CE for today's webcast, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by November 9th, 2020. And a web on demand recording of today's webinar will be posted online at cdc.gov slash one health slash Zohu slash 2020 slash october.html by November 10th, 2020. To receive free CE for the web on demand video of today's webinar, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by November 10th, 2022. Next slide, please. Before we begin today's presentations, Dr. Casey Barton Baravesh, Director of CDC's One Health Office, will share some news and updates. You can begin when you're ready. Thanks, Laura, and hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's Zohu call. We greatly appreciate your help in spreading the word about the Zohu call by sharing the website link with your colleagues from human, animal, environment, and other relevant sectors. Before our presentations, I wanna share a few highlights from today's Zohu call email newsletter. If you're not yet subscribed, you can use the link at the top of the main Zohu call webpage to stay informed. First, CDC's response to the COVID-19 outbreak continues to evolve. Please check CDC's website for the latest guidance and resources, including information about animals and pets. The CDC One Health Federal Interagency COVID-19 Coordination Group, or OFIC, continues to meet to bring together representatives from 18 key federal agencies for weekly meetings so we can share news, updates, publications, and guidance on the One Health aspects of COVID-19. And we're working closely with state partners and other One Health partners as well on all aspects of One Health and COVID-19. At this time, we're aware of 103 confirmed cases of SARS-CoV-2 infections in animals around the world. And today we are gonna hear a bit more about a few of those animals, specifically the large cats. We're also aware of eight mink farms that have been reported to have animals infected with SARS-CoV-2. More information on these animal cases are available on USDA's APHIS website. In the United States, there's no evidence that animals are playing a significant role in the spread of COVID-19. And based on the limited information available to date, the risk of animals, including pets, spreading COVID-19 to people is considered to be low. 
Our main prevention message continues to be if you're sick with COVID-19, you should restrict contact with animals, including your pets, just like you would with people. And talk to your veterinarian if your pet gets sick or if you have any concern about your pet or other animals health. In other One Health news, there's a new online training about navigating the tripartite zoonoses guide available online. If you'll go to the next slide, please. CDC has just released a national public health framework for the prevention and control of vector-borne diseases in humans. Also, you can visit the International Rabies Task Force website to learn more about their free tool, tools for rabies elimination projects. Next slide. Please check out several upcoming observances and events of interest, including One Health Day on November 3rd, which we'll be celebrating in the several days before as well as U.S. Antibiotic Awareness Week occurring in November. Stay tuned for One Health Day resources in the coming weeks. We also encourage you to celebrate One Health Day, not just on November 3rd, but in the weeks leading up to the event and the week of the observance to help further promote awareness of the importance of a One Health approach. Next slide. There are three new outbreaks of salmonella infections linked to wood ear mushrooms, pet bearded dragons, and pet hedgehogs that have been posted on CDC's website. And our next call is gonna take place on November 4th. So please, please feel free to email topic suggestions for future presentations and news from your organization to zohucall at cdc.gov. And I'll now turn the call back over to Laura, thanks. Thank you. Next slide, please. You can submit um, questions at any time using Zoom's Q&A feature. Please include the topic or presenter's name. The Q&A session will follow the final presentation today. Next slide. Our first presentation, COVID-19 among workers in meat and poultry processing facilities, United States, April to May 2020, will be given by Dr. Michelle A. Waltenberg. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you, Laura. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michelle Waltenberg, and I'm an Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer at the CDC. Today, I'll be speaking about COVID-19 among meat and poultry processing workers in the United States. Next slide, please. I wanted to start by highlighting that outbreaks of COVID-19 among workers workers while ensuring the continuity of food supply chains. Next slide, please. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, the animal slaughtering and processing industry employs an estimated 525,000 workers in approximately 3,500 facilities nationwide. Distinctive factors that affect workers' risk for exposure to SARS-CoV-2 in meat and poultry processing workplaces include distance between workers, duration of contact, and type of contact. These workers often work close to one another on processing lines and may also congregate when clocking in or out, during breaks, or in locker or changing rooms. Workers also have prolonged closeness to workers, up to 10 to 12 hours per shift. Though it is not thought to be the main way the virus spreads, exposure can occur when workers have contact with contaminated surfaces or objects, such as tools, workstations, or break room tables. Other factors that may increase risk include shared transportation to and from the workplace, congregate housing, and frequent community contact with fellow workers. Next slide, please. In April 2020, CDC received the first request for technical assistance for COVID-19 outbreaks among workers in meat and poultry processing facilities. On May 1st, CDC released an MMWR on the first national data call on COVID-19 among meat and poultry processing workers. The report documented 4,913 cases and 20 COVID-19 related deaths among workers from 115 facilities in 19 states through April 27, 2020. Today, I'll be discussing the second national call for data on COVID-19 among meat and poultry processing workers. Next slide, please. In early June 2020, CDC requested that state health departments report aggregate surveillance data through May 31st, 2020 
for workers in all meat and poultry processing facilities affected by COVID-19, including the number and type of meat or poultry processing facility that had reported at least one confirmed COVID-19 case among workers, the total number of workers in affected facilities, the number of workers with laboratory confirmed COVID-19, and the number of COVID-19 related deaths among workers. Next slide, please. States were also asked to report demographic characteristics of age, sex, race, ethnicity, and symptom status of workers with COVID-19, as well as descriptions of intervention and prevention efforts at affected facilities. Next slide, please. I'll now share the findings of our national data call. Overall, 28 of 50 states responded to the data call, including 23, or 82%, that reported at least one confirmed COVID-19 case among meat and poultry processing workers from 239 facilities from March to May 2020. Next slide, please. As of May 31st, 2020, these 239 facilities reported 16,233 COVID-19 cases and 86 COVID-19 related deaths among workers. The median number of affected facilities per state was seven with an interquartile range of three to 14. Next slide, please. Among 14 states that reported the total number of workers in affected facilities, 9.1% of 112,616 workers received diagnoses of COVID-19. The percentage of workers with COVID-19 ranged from 3.1 to 24.5% per facility. Next slide, please. 21 states provided information on demographic characteristics and symptom status of workers with COVID-19. Proportional distributions for these characteristics were calculated for cases after excluding missing and unknown values. Data were missing for sex in 25% of reports, age in 24%, race ethnicity in 39%, and symptom status in 37%. Of 12,000 workers with information on sex, 60% of COVID-19 cases occurred among males. Of 12,365 workers with information on age, 46% of COVID-19 cases occurred among workers aged 40 to 59 years. Next slide, please. Of 9,919 workers with information on race ethnicity, 56% of COVID-19 cases occurred among Hispanic or Latino workers, 19% in non-Hispanic Black workers, 13% in non-Hispanic White workers, and 12% in non-Hispanic Asian workers. Overall, 87% of COVID-19 cases occurred among racial or ethnic minority workers. Next slide, please. Methods for collecting symptom data varied by workplace and symptom status was available for a single time point, at the time of testing or at the time of interview. Of 10,284 workers, with information on symptom status. 88% of workers with COVID-19 were symptomatic and 12% were asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. Next slide, please. States also provided information from direct observation or from management at affected facilities regarding specified intervention and prevention efforts that were implemented. This table shows information on these efforts for 111 facilities from 14 states. The most commonly reported interventions were screening workers on entry, requiring all workers to wear face coverings, increasing the availability of hand hygiene stations, educating workers on community spread, 
installing physical barriers between workers when social distancing was not feasible, and staggering shifts to decrease crowding on entry and exit. Next slide, please. This is a continuation of the previous table showing interventions implemented by affected facilities. Only 37% of facilities reported offering testing for SARS-CoV-2 to workers. 30% reported removing financial incentives, such as attendance bonuses, for workers to continue to work. 22% reported closing temporarily as an intervention measure. 21% reported reducing the rate of animal processing and 15% reported decreasing crowding of shared transportation to and from the work site. Next slide, please. Six states that reported to the first national data call did not contribute to the second data call. Combining data on workers with COVID-19 from both national data calls, as of May 31st, 2020, at least 17,358 cases of COVID-19 and 91 COVID-19 related deaths have occurred among meat and poultry processing workers from 264 facilities in the United States. Next slide, please. Demographic characteristics of total worker populations in affected facilities were not available limiting the ability to quantify the degree to which some racial and ethnic minority groups might be disproportionately affected by COVID-19 in this industry. We compared the racial or ethnic distribution among cases to the general workforce using animal slaughtering and processing industry data. Among animal slaughtering and processing workers from the 21 states who reported race ethnicity among cases approximately 39% were non-Hispanic white, 30% were Hispanic or Latino, 25% were non-Hispanic black, and 6% were non-Hispanic Asian. However, among workers with COVID-19 with reported race ethnicity, 56% were Hispanic or Latino, and 12% were non-Hispanic Asian, suggesting that non-Hispanic Asian and Hispanic or Latino workers might be disproportionately affected by COVID-19 in this workplace setting. Ongoing efforts to reduce incidence and better understand the effects of COVID-19 on the health of racial and ethnic minorities are important to ensure that workplace specific prevention strategies and intervention messages are tailored to those groups most affected by COVID-19. Next slide, please. Among workers with known symptom status, 12% were asymptomatic or presymptomatic. However, these infections are more likely to be identified in facilities that perform facility-wide testing. Since not all facilities tested all employees, many asymptomatic and presymptomatic infections in the overall workforce were likely not captured and these approximations for disease prevalence might underestimate SARS-CoV-2 infections among workers. Next slide, please. In coordination with state and local health agencies, many facilities have implemented interventions to reduce transmission or prevent ongoing exposure within the workplace, including offering testing to workers. Expanding interventions across these facilities nationwide might help protect workers in this industry. Recognizing the interaction of workplace and community, many facilities have also educated workers about strategies for reducing transmission of COVID-19 outside the workplace. Next slide, please. CDC and OSHA have developed guidance for meat and poultry processing workers and employers. Additionally, a meat and poultry processing facility assessment toolkit has been developed, which contains resources for occupational safety and health professionals and state and local public health officials assessing COVID-19 among workers in these facilities. 
CDC and the U.S. Department of Labor have also developed guidance for agriculture workers and employers. These resources are available on CDC's website at the links shown on the slide. Next slide, please. I'd like to note that our analysis is subject to a few limitations. These results might not be representative of all U.S. meat and poultry processing facilities and workers, as not all states responded to the data call, and only facilities with at least one laboratory-confirmed case of COVID-19 among workers were included. These approximations for disease prevalence might underestimate SARS-CoV-2 infections among workers due to, due to delays in identifying workplace outbreaks and variations in testing availability and practices. Information on interventions was available for a subset of affected facilities and might not be generalizable to all facilities. This information was also subject to self-report by facility management and all available intervention efforts might not have been captured. Further evaluation of the extent of control measures and timing of implementations is needed to assess effectiveness of these control measures. Finally, workers in this industry are members of their local communities and their source of exposure and infection could not be determined. For those living in communities experiencing widespread transmission, exposure might have occurred within the surrounding community as well as the work site. I'd also like to note that many meat and poultry processing workers are from many different countries, languages, cultures, and immigration status, including refugees. Culturally and linguistically appropriate public health monitoring and interventions, including access to interpreters, are critical for this workforce population. Next slide, please. In conclusion, highly populated workplace settings such as meat and poultry processing facilities present ongoing challenges to preventing and reducing the risk for SARS-CoV transmission among workers. Targeted workplace specific prevention strategies are critical to reducing COVID-19 associated occupational risk and health disparities among disproportionately affected populations. Lessons learned from investigating outbreaks of COVID-19 in these facilities could inform investigations in other food production and agriculture workplaces to help prevent and reduce COVID-19 transmission among all workers in these essential industries. Next slide, please. I'd like to conclude by thanking the many individuals at CDC who were involved in this analysis and publication in MMWR. I'd also like to thank our state and local health department partners for their continued collaboration, the affected facilities and surrounding communities, as well as the CDC COVID-19 Response Health Department Task Force field team deployers. Thank you. Thank you. Our next combined presentation about SARS-CoV-2 infection in tigers and lions and staff working with them at the Bronx Zoo is by Dr. Paul P. Kelly and Dr. Sally Slavinsky. Please begin when you're ready. Um, thank you very much and thank you for um, having us participate today. Um, I'll be beginning and then turn it over to Dr. Slavinsky. If I could have the next slide, please. On March 27th of this year, the number of human COVID-19 cases in the US surpassed China for the most in the world. And most of those US cases and deaths were in New York State and specifically within New York City. So we became the global epicenter for the pandemic at that time. Next slide, please. Also on that day, Nadia began to cough. And so this just puts in context, you know, the environment that um, we were working under at the time. Next slide, please. So Nadia um, is a four-year-old female Malayan tiger born at the Bronx Zoo, and she was hand-raised. And on the 27th of March, she developed a minimally productive cough. In that same Bronx Zoo facility in the following week, three more tigers became ill, and the fifth tiger in that facility um, was not affected. Next slide, please. 
And over that same week, um, we had three lions in a separate facility also develop clinical signs. And the lions and tigers were young to middle-aged, all but one were born at the Bronx Zoo, and that tiger that was not born at the Bronx Zoo arrived um, five years earlier. Both sexes were affected. All of the cats developed a cough. Most of them also had some wheezing, and most of them were a short clinical course of one to five days. None of them developed dyspnea or an ocular or nasal discharge, and there was no depression or abnormal behaviors. A few of them developed um, intermittent epistaxis or GI upset, and it's not at all clear if that was related to infection, but for completeness sake, um, we share that information. And Nadia was the only exception because she actually coughed for a total of 16 days. Next slide, please. Um, on the 2nd of April, because she had been sick for a week, all these other cats had become ill, and then she was beginning to go off feed, um, she was anesthetized for treatment, evaluation, and testing. And the staff um, involved with the procedure working around her head and face wore N95 masks um, and face shields. Uh, other staff in the area wore uh, surgical masks and gloves and protective clothing. She was treated with fluids, antibiotics, and supportive care. The physical exam and radiographs and ultrasound were performed. Routine blood work was run, and we collected samples to run a panel of uh, more typical domestic cat feline pathogens, and ultimately all of those tests came back negative. And because of what we were experiencing in New York City at the time, of course, we considered that this could be a SARS-CoV-2 infection. And so nasal and oropharyngeal swabs and a tracheal wash were collected for that testing. And I'll now turn it over to Dr. Slavinsky um, for the next part of the presentation. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? I'm assuming you can hear me. Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, so just very quickly, uh, I'm, I'm very honored to have this opportunity to speak with you all today and certainly delighted to be able to present with my colleague, Dr. Paul Kelly. So, uh, you know, I wanted to start by building on what Dr. Kelly had already shared and described what was happening in New York City at the time of this event. Between March and early April of this year, there was widespread community transmission of SARS-CoV-2 and the number of new COVID-19 cases reported in New York City was increasing with between 2,000 and 3,000 each day to over 6,000 in that, in that first week of April, uh, which was a time when we were nearing the peak of our outbreak. New York pause had been implemented on March 22nd, mandating the closure of our non-essential businesses and schools had moved to all remote learning. There was limited testing available and PPE supplies for healthcare personnel was scarce and in some instances just unavailable. Um, at that time, the full spectrum of COVID-19 illness was not fully recognized and we still had a, a limited uh, understanding or maybe appreciation of the extent of asymptomatic transmission uh, and the use of face coverings uh, was uh, issued by CDC on April 3rd. Next slide, please. So these images convey what it was like um, uh, here and probably for many of you. New York City, normally a bustling center of activity, was, was ghostly quiet as people complied with pause and in general were hesitant to go out even to get uh, appropriate medical care. Um, kind of interesting anecdote, during this time we had some of our lowest, or actually our lowest air particulate matter readings, uh, our, our proxy for air pollution, uh, which ironically now are at their highest as we've gradually opened up uh, and many people are continuing to avoid uh, using public transportation and we're seeing more and more cars on the roads. Uh, next slide, please. So our hospitals were overwhelmed, many of you have also experienced that, um, and extensive planning went into creating and staffing these alternate care sites to accept and tend to patients as many hospitals had reached capacities. Uh, these alternate care sites included uh, the USNS Comfort, uh, these emergency field hospital tents that you see in Central Park, and the Jacob Javits Convention Center in Manhattan was temporarily configured as a makeshift hospital. 
Next slide, please. So here's a timeline of the events of the investigation, and we're going to refer back to this timeline and, and build upon it over the course of this presentation. Um, uh, March 1st was when New York City reported its first recognized person with COVID-19, and as already described, uh, you can see the epi curve for New York City as the number of people with COVID-19 continued to rise through March. Uh, New York State pause was issued on March 22nd, and it was early April, April 3rd, when the routine use of face coverings for source protection was recommended. Next slide, please. So that was setting the stage for the investigation. And I, I also want to take some time to describe the longstanding relationship between WCS and the New York City Health Department. Uh, as many of you uh, know all too well, having established relationships is key to responding uh, in a crisis. And this connection goes back to 1999, actually probably earlier, but in 1999 we had the discovery of West Nile virus. And the relationship has evolved over the years. We've worked together, been fortunate to work together on multiple projects, including vaccinating raccoons against rabies, um, doing a health survey of New York City raccoons. Um, they also graciously host uh, uh, at their Central Park Zoo our New York City Animal Working Group meeting, which brings together animal and public health partners from the federal, state, and local level, and all of whom operate in New York City uh, for a day of presentations and discussions. Next slide, please. So other longstanding relationships that many of you have uh, with um, your own folks, but Dr. Dave Smith, our state veterinarian, uh, and many of my public health veterinary colleagues led to the initial notification that something was up. And so there was multiple calls going back and forth between Dr. Smith, Dr. Connie Austin in Illinois, uh, Dr. Callie, and myself, and several others about the specimens going to the diagnostic labs at the veterinary schools at University of Illinois and Cornell University. Um, and then with the report of the preliminary positive results the following day, this, this circle of communication expanded to include uh, Dr. Andy Newman at New York State Department of Health uh, and many of our great colleagues at CDC and USDA. And I will turn it back over to Dr. Callie with the next slide. Um, thank you very much. And um, SARS-CoV-2 is an OIE reportable disease, and that's the World Animal Health Organization. And the way that is um, managed in the United States is you need a state veterinarian's approval in order to submit samples um, to a laboratory for this testing. Um, and the laboratories in the U.S. National Animal Health Laboratory Network conduct those testing and they either report the results as a negative or a presumptive positive, and then confirmatory testing has to be conducted by USDA's National Veterinary Services Laboratory, um, and they do the OIE reporting. Um, so a number of the individuals and agencies that Sally mentioned were part of these uh, permissions and process for submitting the samples. Um, on the 3rd of April, the day after the samples were collected, nasal and oropharyngeal swabs and a tracheal wash sample were uh, PCR presumptive positive at both um, Cornell and University of Illinois Veterinary Laboratories. Those samples were then sent to NVSL where the results were confirmed as positive the next day. And the day after that, um, the USDA were the ones who um, first issued the public press release of the diagnosis, and that's part of the OIE reporting structure um, within the United States. And that fo was followed by institutional releases by all of the uh, participating partners in that. And you can see the timeline was very rapid, um, and it was really important for all of us to be communicating, coordinating, and um, reviewing each other's press releases so that once USDA released the information, um, we all followed with our own uh, releases. Next slide, please. Um, virus was isolated from that tracheal wash sample. And although fecal testing wasn't initially conducted, um, later on when it was, uh, virus was isolated from both one tiger and one lion. 
And the PCR testing that was done on feces over a prolonged period of time um, indicated positives in all five tigers, including the asymptomatic one, and three lions. And although the index case was not assessed at presentation by fecal PCR testing, it was assessed later. Um, and the PCR testing was positive for up to 30 days after respiratory signs resolved. But it is important to note that that PCR testing um, confirmed SARS-CoV-2 specific RNA, but not necessarily confirmation of replication competent virus. So we have not done fecal viral cultures on every sample that was collected. And I'll turn it back over to Dr. Slavinsky now. Thank you. So um, upon learning of the results uh, from uh, Nadia, the obvious question was how, uh, how was she and the other tigers and lions uh, infected, or were the other tigers and lions infected? And so given what was known at the time with regard to SARS-CoV-2 transmission from people to cats, it was hypothesized the initial tigers and lions were infected from exposure to a person who was shedding the virus. Um, so we also wanted to ensure, too, that uh, there, was, there were measures in place to prevent the possibility of transmission from infectious tigers and lions to, to people. Next slide, please. So going back to our timeline, uh, as described by Dr. Kelly, Nadia's specimens were collected on April 2nd. Uh, the presumptive positive results were reported out the next day. Um, and then the onsets of illness for the tigers and then the lions spanned from March 27th, uh, which was Nadia's initial onset, through April 3rd. Next slide, please. So we focused on the, the rolling two weeks, or what was approximately three weeks preceding the animal's onsets of illness. Uh, and here I have to do a big shout out to the person at WCS who was really instrumental to this part of the investigation. Uh, Tate, Caitlin Dugan is a family nurse practitioner and the manager of human health services for the WCS operations in New York City. So we looked at which staff were work in the, working in the areas where the tigers and lions reside, and of those identified, who among them was sick. Uh, and then we also inquired about the, the various types of interactions that occurred between the staff and the animals. And as Dr. Kelly mentioned, there were no exposures to the public uh, as the zoo had been closed to visitors. Um, limited staff were scheduled to work on site during this time, and the zoo had a, a strict and supportive work policy in order to keep anyone who was sick from, from going to work. Um, and we were able to identify 12 staff during the time frame who had an opportunity to interact with the tigers and or the lions. Next slide, please. So of the 12 staff, there was four that reported being ill during, during this uh, two to three week period uh, that was leading up to the animal's onsets of illness. All four described a mild illness with signs and symptoms that were consistent with COVID-19. Um, none of the four reported going to work while ill, though all had onset of illness within 24 hours of being at work. Um, no one else self-reported being ill, though during some of the interviews there was a mention of coughing by uh, a staff who themselves had not self-identified as being ill. And so it's possible that during some of the interviews uh, some of these staff maybe forgot or didn't think that uh, any of the symptoms that they had were uh, due to COVID-19 and ascribed to something else. Um, and also just to mention, um, you know, there may have been some recall issues as some of the reported dates of work and working location did not always match with the work schedule. Next slide, please. So here we're going back to the timeline and you can see how the staggered onsets of illness for the staff preceded that of the tigers and lions. And so for the, the staff onset illness, uh, those dates ranged from uh, March 20th through March 28th. Next slide, please. So 
we made arrangements to uh, have the four staff who reported illness uh, tested, and uh, with Caitlin, we were able to collect both an NP swab and serum from each. The PCR, PCR testing was run on the NP swabs at our New York City Public Health Laboratory, and serology was done at the New York State Wadsworth Center Laboratory. Next slide, please. So again, looking back at the timeline, uh, you can see the staff specimens were collected uh, just a few days after receiving the positive test results for, for Nadia. So as Dr. Kelly was describing, this was all happening uh, very quickly. Um, next slide, please. So these four staff uh, all reported uh, a mild illness. The duration of illness ranged from three to seven days. All of them reported fever and cough, uh, and other complaints included myalgia, uh, fatigue, loss of sense of taste and smell, nausea, and diarrhea. Two of them reported having household contacts with COVID-19-like illness, and all reported having a coworker um, with a, a symptom who, who reported a symptom of COVID-19. Next slide, please. So testing revealed that all four of the staff who had been tested uh, had uh, evidence of infection. They all had a positive test result. One was positive by PCR only. Uh, another was positive by PCR and serology. And then two were positive by serology only. Next slide, please. So looking at the interactions between the staff and the tigers and the lions, masks had not been routinely worn for regular husbandry, um, and no direct contact uh, between the animals and the staff was identified. Next slide, please. The staff did describe a variety of regular husbandry activities uh, and environmental conditions that brought them within six feet or less of the tigers and the lions. And these included things like moving the animals between uh, their pens and their exhibits, feeding or medicating them through the fenced enclosure, uh, training, uh, greetings, and, and various social interactions that occurred, um, including things like chuffing or blowing air. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, like I was not, uh, chuffing is is something of a social greeting that occurs between tigers and, and then also uh, with their human keepers where the tigers make this low uh, sound that they emit in these short, loud bursts. Um, and it's something where they're able to push air through their nostrils. And I've uh, been told it's the equivalent of a, of a domestic cat's purring. Um, and then also of note, there is an office space uh, with a desk that is used daily by the keepers, uh, which was situated in the same uh, space as the lion pens and where the placement of the desk was less than six feet from uh, the lion pens themselves. Next slide, please. So WCS wanted to be sure that measures were in place to prevent further exposure to the animals as well as reduce the possible risk of virus transmission from the animals to the staff. So they had adopted several measures, including uh, the routine use of masks to minimize transmission of the virus from asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic staff um, to each other as well as to the animals. Um, and then also uh, we took time to consult with uh, CDC subject matter experts uh, to confirm that the revised practices in PPE that had been adopted for use by WCS staff were appropriate for their routine husbandry, uh, the cleaning of the pens and handling of uh, feces uh, and clinical specimens. And next slide, and I will turn it back to Dr. Kelly. Thank you very much. So um, clearly we had transmission from an asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic keeper um, to the cats because, and no one worked when ill because that's our you know, institutional policy. Um, New York City Department of Health and CDC did genome sequencing of the viral isolates and there was identical viral isolates from a tiger keeper and a tiger. The lions were seropositive, no, uh, or rather the lion keepers were seropositive, but no human isolate was obtained. 
but a lion isolate from feces was a different strain than the tiger isolate. Um, and both of those strains were strains that were circulating in the tri-state area at the time. So it's really remarkable that we had two independent human to cat transmission events. Um, as far as the analysis shows so far, there's nothing unique about those viral strains that would have made them more infectious for cats. And when you look at the number of big cats in zoos in Asia and Europe, um, and the you know, significant COVID infections that occurred in those areas, it's really remarkable that we had two independent transmission events and other ones have not been recognized. And in other countries and zoos, there has been some pretty extensive screening of the animals um, in cities where um, human COVID cases were common and they have not identified other uh, infected animals. Uh, next slide, please. There are a number of possible transmission pathways from people um, to the cats. As Sally had mentioned, at that time we were not using PPE when working around the cats. And although we never go in with adult lions or tigers, there is the potential for direct transmission because of close contact across barriers during the normal husbandry, feeding, training, and enrichment procedures, as you can see in an example in this slide. Um, the two hand-raised tigers were the first to become ill, and they were also the most interactive with staff, so they would have had um, uh, easily direct um, exposure there. It's also possible that food was contaminated during diet preparation and lions and tigers explore their environment and their food by sniffing it. So if there was viral contamination on the surface of the food, when they sniffed it, they could have inhaled it. Um, less likely would have been infection from ingestion. And tigers as adults are a solitary animal, so they were all housed alone, but they did shift through common areas and would explore their environment by sniffing during um, those shifting um, activities. The lions were alternately housed together, so there could have been direct transmission um, from lion to lion. And of course, through vocalization, roars and chuffing and, and other vocalizations, the infectious respiratory secretions could have been um, propelled into the air. Um, when hosing, when high pressure hosing was done, um, aerosols could have been created during those cleaning procedures. And of course, there's good air circulation within the building. Next slide, please. Uh, fortunately, all the cats made uneventful recoveries without any specific treatments. Uh, the index case was at the time of examination was um, serum neutralization positive through serology that was developed at Cornell University. Um, we did have extended um, fecal PCR positives and they are con the labs are continuing to do viral cultures to see how long um, infectious virus could have been present. Um, we do run four zoos in New York City and a number of cats at those four zoos, including tigers and another Bronx Zoo facility. And fortunately, well, all of them remained healthy. We have heard anecdotal reports of a tiger, of tigers at other US zoos that had similar clinical signs, but were not tested. And infection has been confirmed in a mountain lion in South Africa. And in addition, there have been multiple um, instances of domestic cats with confirmed infections. Next slide, please. Um, so we implemented PPE for everyone caring for cats at all of our zoos. And to protect cats from the potential human to cat transmission, surgical masks were used and latex gloves, including when preparing diets. At that time, we were not using N95 masks routinely because there was a real you know, concern about PPE supplies for human healthcare workers in uh, New York City at the time and additional PPE was worn to protect staff who were working with those infected cats to prevent cat to human transmission. And that included face shields or goggles and dedicated clothing. And if veterinary procedures were necessary, those working around the head of the cat would wear N95 masks and face shields and goggles. 
Um, other preventative measures we put in place were postponing elective procedures. We social distance from our cats, so we decrease training and enrichment activities. Um, for cleaning, we would dry clean the enclosures, pick up the feces, um, and disinfect with a potentiated hydrogen peroxide um, uh, disinfectant prior to um, minimal hosing. And we also restricted the people who had access to um, cat areas. And in this slide, these two cats are the actually the first two cats to become infected, Nadia and her sister, both hand raised. And when they were younger, they were housed together, but not as adults. Um, next slide, please. Um, in response to the potential for um, SARS to spread from people to animals uh, and upon recommendations of the AZA species survival plans and taxon advisory groups, um, PPE was worn for working around other species that were potentially um, at risk of infection. And throughout um, this presentation and many preceding ones, we've been very transparent in sharing our information. We don't want anyone else to um, go through what we went through um, with these cats. So it was um, shared with OIE as required by regulation, posted to ProMed, um, shared on the American and European Zoo Vet listservs. We developed a veterinary fact sheet that we shared with our professional colleagues, as well as shared information um, with the SSPs and TAGs. Um, there were many discussions with um, zoo professional peers, uh, public and scientific communications and publications are in process. Um, next slide, please. And the implications of these infections really don't include a threat to wild cat populations. This is a human disease transmitted to zoo cats because of the close contacts people uh, have with the cats in zoos, those who take care of them. Wild cats don't have that close contact with the exception of field handling of wild cats, you would need to use proper PPE in those situations. And the conservation impact of these infections is really a result of decreased protection of wildlife and wild areas, reductions in ecotourism and ranger patrols, and the economic impact on local communities. So it's the the disease itself isn't posing a direct infection conservation threat, um, but there have been really unfortunate impacts of the pandemic on protection of wildlife and wild areas around the world. Next slide. And has previously been mentioned, there really was no significant role of animals in this global pandemic. And other than that original spillover event, there's really infrequent cases of um, transmission uh, from people to animals or animals to people. And it's also important to recognize that while SARS-CoV-2's origin was zoonotic, it has evolved since that ancestral virus, and now it's a highly infectious human respiratory virus transmitted between people. And I'll return it back over to Dr. Slavinsky now. Thank you. So as you might imagine, or, or probably are aware, this, this story certainly received a lot of media attention and uh, highlighting the importance of, of communication, uh, which Dr. Kelly uh, spoke to already. Uh, next slide, please. So having regular calls with our federal, state, and local partners and sharing updates on the investigation really helped inform many of the next steps that were taken. And it also allowed for um, uh, smooth coordination of diagnostic laboratory testing and special studies, including whole genome sequencing and haplotype uh, network analyses uh, that was described by Dr. Kelly, which was done to compare the viruses infecting the keepers and the animals. Um, we okay. ensured we had aligned clear and consistent messaging uh, before reporting the case to um, the World Organization for Animal Health, or OIE, uh, as Dr. Kelly mentioned, and also to prepare the press releases for USDA and WCS to announce the, the cases, um, and then certainly shared talking points uh, to be able to respond in a coordinated fashion to the uh, influx of, of press inquiries. Next slide, please. 
So in summary, these were the first animals in the United States diagnosed with SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, we identified human to animal transition based on findings from our epidemi epidemiologic and laboratory uh, investigations. Uh, the events occurred during a time of, of increasing numbers of people testing positive for COVID-19 and, and, um, and widespread community transmission in, in New York City. Um, and there were multiple opportunities for um, close contact between staff and animals while uh, staff were, were likely infectious uh, that were identified. Next slide, please. So this in investigation is, is another example of one health in action uh, with a coordinated with coordinated collaboration among animal and human health partners at the federal, state, and local level. And existing relationships and infrastructure allowed the investigation to occur in a timely manner. Um, our amazing partners at CDC, um, many thanks to them over and over again um, for all of their contributions and ongoing contributions. They continue to develop consistent messaging from which we um, certainly drew on and relied on. Um, they're subject matter experts who are always readily available for consultation um, and their development and regular revisions of guidance around SARS-CoV-2 and animals, um, and then certainly on the lab side, performing the sequencing to inform and support the findings from the, the uh, EPI investigation. And uh, same, same kudos to our, our partners at USDA, um, always readily available. Um, they were able to rapidly perform the confirmatory testing, um, available to consult on the results and proper interpretation of those results. And, certainly working uh, in alignment with um, our colleagues at CDC on messaging and, and guidance. And then, um, of course, our academic partners who perform diagnostic testing and sequencing uh, to similarly inform and support the findings from our EPI investigation. Next slide, please. Um, and so, uh, you know, this list of acknowledgments is, is not exhaustive. There were so many people who contributed to this uh, investigation. Um, so this is probably not reflective of, ev of everyone and anyone, but a big shout out to so many folks. Uh, next slide, please. And these are just the photo credits, and I will turn it back over to Dr. Kelly. Thanks very much. Um, there are three um, non-peer reviewed posts on um, um, various um, websites that have all of this information. There's also two publications that have been accepted for publication are now in press, one in MBio and one of, in the Journal of Zoo and Wildlife Medicine. So all this information um, is, a, is or will be available to everyone. The, the European Association of Zoo and Wildlife Veterinarians also has a really great um, animal, um, non-domestic animal fact sheet about COVID. So I'd refer people there as well for great information. Um, next slide. And in addition to all the acknowledgements that um, Sally noted, you know, our veterinarians and veterinary technicians in the zoological health program, um, you know, worked really hard on this and worked in close concert with the Bronx Zoo's Department of Homology. And those are the staff that actually cared for these, the keepers cared for these um, sick animals every single day. Um, and um, uh, Sally also mentioned our human health services, uh, who Sally worked closely with on unraveling the, the human side of things. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the um, New York and Illinois state veterinarians who gave approvals for sample submissions. We, as Sally mentioned, we've worked very closely with the New York City Public Health Department for many years. And our laboratory partners, you know, were just great. The, the veterinary labs at Cornell and University of Illinois and NVSL, mm -hmm. and we worked with all of them um, over the years. And, and I'll just revisit um, and reiterate um, Sally's comments about how there was really seamless coordination and communication between city, state, and federal human and animal health agencies, the veterinary schools, and the Bronx Zoo throughout. And it actually kind of was reassuring in the face of this global pandemic and the severity of the impact in New York City, how smoothly and seamlessly that went. Um, so, um, so I thank you for everyone who assisted us through this very challenging time. 
And I don't know if we have any time left for um, questions, but I'm sure both Dr. Slavinsky and I would be happy to try to field any. Thank you, and thanks to all of today's speakers for their informative presentations. Unfortunately, we are out of time to answer any questions, um, but if you do have questions for today's presenters, we've included their email addresses on this slide, um, and they're also on the Zohu Call webpage for today's webinar, as well as in today's email newsletter. Thank you all for your participation. This ends today's webinar. Thank you.